Okay, a warm welcome here to Ritz and the cafe side where we will continue our program this afternoon. And um, next we are turning to the topic of privacy and the Internet of Everything. Associate Professor in Communication and the Digital Economy, Rebecca Rosi from the University of Vasa, will now talk about the psychosocial complexity of privacy in the Internet of every day. She will offer us insight into the nature of system design, collective user experience and the discursive imaginary. Now Rebecca is joining us on Zoom, so a warm welcome and please go ahead Rebecca. Thank you so much. It's just so lovely to almost see you there today. I wish I was <laughs> in Vasa, but hello, it's from near Yavascula. Yes, I am Rebecca Rosme Rosie, an Associate Professor of Communication Studies and Digital Economy. And my, the title of my, my presentation is Privacy and the Internet of Everything. So how do we feel now? This is a part of our Bugged project, um, um, funded by the Research Council of Finland. So today we're going to talk about privacy, the internet of everything, how they link, and of course how we feel. So what do you actually think of when you hear the word privacy? If we turn to Google, <laughs> who draws from the Oxford languages, then we can see privacy as a noun, as a state in which one is not observed or disturbed by other people. Or we can see it as the state of being free from public attention. Um, we can go back through sociology and even psychology and um, look at Ol Ermgren Oldman's um, work on privacy regulation, culturally universal or culturally specific. So basically, er um, Oldman talked about the privacy mechanisms, for instance, that human beings use in social interaction. So um, the things that we say the verbal mechanisms, the things that we don't say but maybe show in our body to kind of like hide or disclose or <laughs> reveal or, <laughs> or uh, I guess, um, mm -mm, hide specific information. And then, of course, the things we do in our environment, curtains, doors, <laughs> screens, cultural practices naturally. So there's also cult codes of behaviour that have come to us through culture that aid us in delineating our barriers and our boundaries between what we will be revealing and what we do not reveal to others about ourselves and, of course, about our situations. So we can see that, you know, like we are more likely to not disclose a lot of information to strangers. I mean, unless, of course, under specific circumstances, or even to acquaintances, to in-laws, friends, family members. And there's social processes such as, for instance, avoidance, taboos or courtship. But historically, we can actually see that privacy as a concept started really kind of taking ground um, in, of course, societal discourse, but also in relation to technology in the 1800s. So as story has it, in the 1890, two American lawyers, Warren and, and Brandes, published an article in the Harvard Law Review. They wrote, because of new technologies, people need the right to be alone with themselves, which they called privacy. And as the story had it, um, Warren had invited some friends over to his house one day and one of these friends happened to have a new fangled gadget, you know, most of us know now as a camera. This visitor took pictures of Warren's lounge room and afterwards Warren actually felt quite violated. He felt that something of his had been stolen 
through taking a picture of his lounge room. So this is why this discourse kind of, or at least as legend has it, the discourse really started gaining ground. What happens to our information and what we disclose of ourselves as technology develops? We also have another sociologist, Helen Nissenbaum, who's actually talked about privacy in context, understanding the fact that our sense of privacy and the way that we protect it or the way that we reveal information, disclose, is very highly contextually dependent. But she had this A, B, C of privacy. So she had A for privacy, the appropriate flow of information, how much is too much, how little is too little. B, appropriateness, so informational norms in a given context. So, I mean, what is normal to be disclosed in a specific context and what maybe is not? And then C, information norms. So um, five key parameters, which are, of course, reliant on the sender of the information, the subject that's in question, uh, information type, the recipient, and of course, the transmission principle, which in a sense kind of links very much to Altman's theory. So <clears throat> we also see Stuart et al. in 2019 stating that for a psychological and interactional process-based approach to privacy, a useful definition can be found in Margulis, 1977. So actually a lot of this research also was being published during the 70s and 80s, where privacy is described as selective control over transactions between self or one's group and others the ultimate aim of which is to enhance autonomy and or to minimise vulnerability. Hmm. Okay, so in recent years, we have had some <laughs> fantastic initiatives, <laughs> such as the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, which in a sense is supposed to heighten individual control over one's own data through giving the ability to either opt in or opt out, um, which kind of follows suit if we think about these definitions that I've given you just previously um, in relation to privacy and the importance of this control factor, how much information I am willing to give and not give. Um, naturally, in the fairly short history of the internet, we've very rapidly grown accustomed to understanding the fact that the internet is con collecting a lot of data about us. And GDPR is helping us in the sense that it's giving us these automatic cookies that we, of course, read every single word of before accepting. <laughs> or, um, but then... Also, we have kind of other internets around us. And, of course, this is what has been referred to as the Internet of Things, um, the Internet of Everything, and the Internet of Bodies. So Internet is embedded throughout our house, throughout our systems, throughout our environment, and naturally one of the, the big areas that, you know, we have not too much control over in terms of opting in or opting out is, for instance, um, video camera technology, um, CCTV surveillance in um, environments. A really interesting colleague of mine has some fascinating papers um, where they've actually represented what they've developed. They've developed apps to inform people of routes in cities where you can actually avoid the CCTV cameras. I mean, so that's kind of one radical form of opting out. But our sensors and our internet is embedded everywhere. And more and more, we're also kind of willingly engaging in having quite highly personal data collected and stored and handled by the internet. And this is despite the discussions on privacy around and despite GDPR. So, <clears throat> I mean, 
This is where we're at at the moment. Um, you look everywhere, you look in um, public media and online discussions. And for instance, here we have the insider intelligence talking about the security and privacy issues that come with the Internet of Things. And it's estimated, for instance, that in or by 2026, almost half of US households will have smart home devices. Um, already now in Finland in 2023, we are seeing that um, I guess there's fewer and fewer houses that actually are <laughs> connected to the internet and somehow have um, smart home devices, even our washing machines. <laughs> But the increase in connected devices gives hackers and criminals, cyber criminals, more entry points, naturally. And of course, do you work in the tech industry? Get business insights? No, let's not do that. So is it creepy or is it spooky? Um, one of the incentives behind our um, bugged project was to in investigate, you know, like, I mean, a spookiness, a spookiness of um, what is happening with this data collection, not just the fact that, I mean, of course, our traces, our our search terms, our voices and even our faces are being recorded and stored by massive cloud data storage, but also the actual sensation of understanding that somehow, you know, traces of ourselves, our information, our identity is being stored and perhaps being used by others. So this spookiness was one of the points of departure before and um, behind our project in thinking of what are the stress levels um, that occur or um, that, and what, what are the levels of stress that happen when we start to actually think about and when, of course, we've become aware about the fact that our data and, and parts of us are being kind of touched and probed and, and, and sold um, by others. And during our early stages, we actually came across this idea of creepiness. And actually, one of our great partners is um, Irina Shlovsky in our project. Phil Levakri, our postdoc, is currently in Copenhagen for a year at Shlovsky's um, um, lab. And, and she's written a number of papers about creepiness. And creepiness, as compared to spookiness, which is, I mean, and spookiness is kind of like a more arise, um, aroused sense of, of stress. Creepiness is more this resignated um or oh, hang on acceptance where well we don't really like it but we know that it's just there so far our research has been starting to reveal quite a few interesting things one of which of course is this relationship between sender and context and receiver and um there's been much discussion about gdpr for instance in um, research and one of our studies has actually shown the fact that, well, people are more likely to trust a researcher, and particularly for research purposes, and if the data is being stored responsibly by the research organisation. As soon as third parties, and particularly private sector third parties, come into the equation, suddenly trust levels drop. So that will be presented at Hicks in um, January. And then also we've been delving into some machine learning because naturally um, the internet of everything isn't necessarily exactly what we're just interacting with to gain information and somehow gain <laughs> assistance through our devices that our washing machines turn on. But there's bigger systems in question and more and more we're starting to discuss the area of multi-robot cooperation, for instance, and this is something that our team has been diving into as well. What happens when it's not simply fridges talking to each other, but it's actually, you know, full-blown robots within our houses, whether it's a vacuum cleaner, a robot arm, and what kind of ethical concerns do we need to um, consider? We are also running social distance studies, so looking at the dynamics between um, the, the user of systems, for instance, in the context of GPS, and then, of course, perceived or understood receivers of the data, and who are the, those or who is the imaginary that is kind of interacting with the receiver, the user. We also have a robo study, a, a kind of <laughs> robo teacher study, cyber life, looking at um, how this sits 
within the context of life online, online, um, online, offline life overall, virtual reality. And of course, our goal is to design for comfort. Um, and again, we're not going to leave it just at that. We will kind of probe, probe and problematize this whole idea, which is what we're doing. We also currently have a call for papers. We're um, teaming with colleagues from the University of Tampere on this special issue, ethics and sustainability in gaming and, per and persuasive systems. So if you're interested and your research kind of comes close to this, please join, please submit. Um, deadline 30th of June, 2024. And otherwise, I didn't have too much time to see it speak, so I'd like to thank you for listening. Do you have any questions? Is there time? <laughs> Thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, are there any questions in the audience? I just have one question to pose myself. Um, you describe a very changing and sometimes very spooky new technical technological landscape. How uh, will this landscape uh, affect our general sense of trust in others and society, do you think? Well, this is a huge problem at the moment. And as, for instance, Rachel Botsman's um, been starting to emphasize, trust is now a, a, a strong commodity. I mean, <laughs> if your organization does have trust, then you have um, a one up on your competition. Um, trust is a huge issue, particularly now that we're diving into the era of deep fakes, for example, as just one um one example so um so this is something whether or not we will in fact you know have trust is um a question in its own how we make sense of the world and how we're able to adjust our lives to be able to cope with this lack of trust and then of course no doubt there will be new mechanisms and new criteria through which you know like I mean, both individuals as well as um, societies and cultural communities as a whole learn to read the signs um, of the technology and its design. I mean, as we already are starting to do now, I mean, and this in a sense is kind of like a part of the idea behind GDPR anyway, is to strategically place a structure so that, I mean, people understand that they have somewhat control or at least there is someone trying to monitor i mean if that I, we're in a bit of a mess at the moment but a mess with some hope still uh, with those words <laughs> a big thank you to you rebecca let's give her a big applause thank you thank you <laughs>